Infections acquired during healthcare delivery are a major problem for global health, causing harm to patients and putting the very notion of safe, trusted health systems at risk for all countries. One in 10 patients get an infection while receiving care. Infections cause up to two thirds of deaths among hospital-born babies. These are just a few shocking problems we are facing in our world. But healthcare-associated infections are avoidable, and to prevent these infections, including those antibiotic-resistant, is a key priority for WHO. This is why WHO has engaged experts and colleagues with field experience to resolve this problem. Also based on scientific evidence, we all together identified the core components that make IPC programs successful to prevent harm. The uh, new core components are absolutely essential for us to have for low resource settings because WHO documents carry a lot of clout with the ministries of health. It, it, it can prove to be cost effective, but most importantly, the IPC focal people working in healthcare facilities find it a great support and it gives them the clout to do their job properly. So infection control is really critical to the control of antibiotic resistance. You know, if you think about the spread of antibiotic resistance, it's just like a bushfire. And of course, yes, we need new fire trucks and new helicopters, that is new antibiotics, but they're five or ten years away. And in the meantime, we need a fire break, and that fire break is good infection control. And so this is why the core components are so critical, whether you're a wealthy country or a poor country, all countries need a national policy on infection control, and the core components are exactly what we need to direct that effort. WHO recommendations identify eight core components that make infection prevention and control effective and aim to support countries and health facilities to prevent healthcare associated infections and antimicrobial resistance. That's great. The first component is about having an infection prevention and control program supported by dedicated budget and trained staff. Infection prevention control programs are essential in healthcare facility level because healthcare associated infections lead to high cost and high mortality. In order to ensure establishment of strong infection control programs, we need to make sure there is political commitment at the highest level, starting with a resolution at the World Health Assembly and then moving on to establishment of regional programs. The second component is to have and implement guidelines on infection prevention and control standards and operating procedures. For us, guidelines provide a standard that we can follow. We can all agree on. So now we have, like for example, in Chile, the healthcare providers, the directors of the hospitals or the infection control programs use the guidelines in order to allocate resources or organize healthcare in order to make it safer for patients. The third component is education and practical training based on infection prevention and control principles and best practices for healthcare workers, managers and other professionals. Education and training can change practice if we do four things. Number one, if we contextualize within the experiences. Two, make it very practical. Three, have champions to drive the process, and four, get the administrators involved by having a proper advocacy plan. The fourth component is healthcare-associated infection surveillance and timely feedback of results, both at the national and facility level, to detect the problem and guide interventions. So when hospitals do surveillance, they usually measure the burden of infections and describe the pathogens causing infections and their resistance pattern. Good quality surveillance data contributes to tailored prevention activities to reduce the burden of infections and resistance of organisms. The fifth component is the use of multimodal strategies uh, to implement recommendations to improve practices at the point of care. These guidelines reinforce the value of multimodal strategies for decision makers, for leaders, for implementers. And what this means is making sure the right resources are in place, the infrastructure to support improvement. It means using the most effective methods of training and education. It means checking that the right thing is happening at the right time, monitoring and evaluation and feedback. It means 
communicating and advocating and campaigning for infection prevention and all of this taking place within a culture that supports improvement in infection prevention and control. All countries and all health facilities can benefit using a multimodal approach to protect people. The sixth component is regular monitoring of healthcare practices according to standards and guidelines, followed by timely feedback of the results, both at the national and facility level. Yeah, I think monitoring in the field of infection control is a very important issue. And for instance, I would like to give you an example from my own country. Uh, we have established hand hygiene consumption as an indicator for good hand hygiene. And meanwhile, more than 1,000 hospitals in our country are using this indicator and we were able to achieve a lot of increase in this field. The seventh component is to make sure that bed occupancy does not exceed the standard capacity of the facility and that staffing levels are adequate according to patient workload. Level of staff and bed occupancy, we have three major challenges to overcome. First is the lack of human resources in, on IPC. The second is the lack of the involvement of administration. And third, we have a lack of involvement of patients and families. So we have to address all these challenges if you want to overcome this problem. Establishing a team at the national level provides guidance and leadership that could accelerate the momentum that is needed to ensure that IPC is implemented throughout the country. The eighth component is to ensure that patient care activities are undertaken in a clean, hygienic environment with adequate infrastructures and equipment, in particular for hand hygiene. Water and sanitation are absolutely fundamental to preventing infections. I think this is overlooked. We know it's overlooked. We uh, did a global report where we understand that 40% of hospitals are without you know, a source of water. And you know, that's unacceptable. We walk into these health facilities and we see unhygienic conditions and we know diseases are going to be spread. So this is something that is um, absolutely uh, wonderful that it's been included in these guidelines as a prerequisite. The last um, um, public health emergencies of international concern that was declared by the WHO so showed that how important it is to have infection prevention and control in place for member states to fight epidemics and fight emergencies. If we are better prepared, if we have infection prevention control structure in place, we have a better chance to fight these emergencies. One of the great lessons learned from outbreaks like Ebola and MERS and SARS is the importance of strong infection prevention and control from a global health perspective to prevent the next epidemic. Effective infection prevention and control can lead to more than 30% reduction of healthcare-associated infections. However, implementing the recommended core components isn't always easy and takes time and commitment but there are great examples around the world that this is possible, even with limited resources. Countries and healthcare facilities engaging to do this will reduce infections and antimicrobial resistance and will save money. Most importantly, this will make patients safer and save lives. Thank you for committing to infection prevention and control.